I think the last time I talked to Matt was probably during my freshman year of college, but um, no, the timing was, I mean, timing is always terrible with something like that, but it was two weeks before I graduated, I got a call from a mutual friend of ours and she told me, you know, Matt died, and I thought it was anything that could have killed anybody, like total freak accident, like car wreck, something like that. When she said heroin overdose, I was like, uh, you gotta back up, you gotta tell me what's going on, like, how did this happen? And you know, coming home for the funeral and the service and everything, and I'm talking to all these old faces and come to realize it had just, he had just been kind of declining in terms of substance abuse over the years. And I had a sense that that was happening. Like he started doing prescription pills and painkillers like when we were still in high school. And I just never knew how bad it had gotten. Like I never came close to seeing the worst of it. Matt always had he had a very charming personality and he always had an invincible sense about him. Like not only did he believe he could do anything, but he made you believe he could do anything. And he, he to prove that point, he would do some crazy, crazy stuff. He, he could have an idea and you could say, I don't know about this. And then five minutes later, you'd be having the time of your life. Yeah. He was, he was, he had a real silver tongue and he was almost, he was like a, he was like a 15 year old James Bond, or at least I like, I think that's how he liked to see himself. His daredevil personality got more and more aggressive as we went through high school. And he was, um, I mean, he, we, we were drinking at a young age and it, it was something that made me uncomfortable. And as it went along, I started to see, you know, prescription pills and whatnot, and by that point I was like, hey, this is not the way to be. I'm really uncomfortable with this. We definitely had a good time with each other, but yeah, as we got older, I gained more notice of just where he was headed, and all I didn't know what was coming. All I knew was that I didn't want to be around for it. His dad, um, his dad sent him off to rehab, I think, how many times? Uh, at least three. Uh, yeah, I was going to say there were three separate occasions. Um, I mean, there was definitely effort from all people who loved him, who all said, you need help, something needs to happen. But there were also an extraordinary amount of people who cared very deeply for him in his life, who had no idea how bad it had gotten. I think I, he and I were separated at that point, and it was something, what made it particularly hard, the timing of his death, was I had been thinking a lot about him. Like his birthday had just happened right around the time he had died and I knew it was my senior year and I knew I was coming back to Easton. And I figured, I was like, you know, who's gonna still be in town? Jake will still be there, Matt will still be there, Alex, Ben, all those people. And I was like, well, that'll be nice and I may as well, you know, try and reconnect. And then, you know, you have that thought one day and then the very next day it's like request denied. Yeah, I would say it definitely came from a place of grieving. The process I went through, my gut reaction was, as I said, I hadn't spoken to him in three years and my gut reaction was, oh no, I knew he had problems, but I had no idea how bad they had gotten. Maybe if I hadn't just, you know, ceased communication, cut him out of my life, I could have done something. I could have really helped them. And through very good friends and, and family and all that is, I was told like, you know, that's not the appropriate reaction to have. Like, there's really nothing you could have done. Like, you have to understand that. So I uh, kept myself busy pretty much throughout the summer following his death, but really never got a chance to really analyze those emotions. And I finally went back, couldn't take it anymore, wrote some stuff down and around Halloween of last year, went to visit Jake in his senior year of college. And I said, you know, read this. To be clear, the film is not a documentary. It is, it's a fictional narrative based heavily, heavily influenced off of what we've done. It's sort of a, uh, it's a coming of age story because the way I wrote it, I wanted to write it, I didn't want to write something incredibly depressing and how do you do that with, you know, heroin being a talking point. So I started it right where we were then, which was his funeral and I had just gotten out of college. And I started winding back the years so that from, for his side of the story, you could really see how somebody goes from being a sweet 12 year old kid and a few short years go by and that person's gone. Like it's a, it's a, it's an analysis of how you get from A to B. And I think in terms of preventing it 
from a high schooler is uh, you got to give them outlets. You got to give them something to do. Like you got to really, I mean, that's what I had. Like I made my own thing to do in high school and I got, I, re I remember in our earliest years, parents would come up to me at 17 or 18 and they'd be like, oh, it's great that you're doing this. Cause you know, I think it, at the time the saying was keeps the kids off the streets and I being 18 years old, I didn't really know what they meant. I was like, what, what kids, what streets? We don't have problems around here. And you know, with perspective, you're like, oh, mm. I mean, not that I think anyone who ever came through the underground actors had any sort of problem like that at all. But I mean, I now have the hindsight to realize what it meant to parents in the area who, you know, I'm sure they had friends whose kids had different problems, but it's, I'd say an outlet. Like kids are looking for something to do and if they don't figure out what it is they want to do, they will find something else, something more dangerous to do. Um, and I think another thing that's very, very understated is the power of peer pressure. Like you have those charismatic people, like Matt was one of those very charismatic people who could talk you into doing anything. And uh, like I, I think people very much undervalue how influential another person can be, just somebody who's got more confidence. Because I mean, if anyone really thinks far enough back, nobody, nobody thinks they had any confidence in high school, but there are certainly those who have more of it than, than others do. And I think the last thing is just good old fashioned love. Like show your kids love. Like yes, they're in high school. Yes, they're so embarrassed by their parents and they think it's disgusting. But like in your own private way, just teachers, parents, like every adult needs to show kids, especially at that vulnerable age, just unconditional love. They need to feel it or else they're going to feel like they're not worth anything. And that makes an addiction a lot more possible because if some substance is showing them something that another human being isn't, then it's going to be that much more easy for them to get hooked. I mean, I've spoken with many, many parents who have lost young 18, 19 year old kids to overdoses and it's, I mean, as much as as much pain as me or any other friend might have, there is there are those who are hurting much worse. So the best thing I can do with my pain is use it to help ease the pain of others.